Greetings, my fellow explorers, and welcome to another Warhammer 40k lore video dedicated to the types of worlds in the Imperium. Last episode, we covered the much more primitive feral and feudal world types, though, like you've seen, being more backwards technologically in that situation actually brings less taxes and more security. Today, we are going to be covering two of the more significant Imperial planet types, and I'm saying significant because they do contribute more in the overall Imperium. And these world types are the Hive Worlds and the Shrine Worlds. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn more about the heavily populated domains of the Emperor, shall we? A hive world is the most populous type of imperial planet. According to the Adeptus Administratum, there are over 32,000 such worlds in the Imperium. The populations of these planets are so great that the people live in huge urban arcologies called hive cities, truly immense, self-contained, many-layered structures that reach high into the sky, each one housing billions of individuals. Hive worlds often provide much needed labor, their manufactoria providing mountains of war material and other goods to satisfy the imperial tithe. Most hive worlds started out as relatively hospitable places to live, but have become severely polluted, the areas outside the hives reduced to ash wastes or radioactive desert by the never-ending industry of the great cities. Equally dangerous can be the hives themselves. The crime-ridden, poverty-stricken areas, almost always found in the most polluted and decrepit lower levels of the underhive, are home to violent gangs, criminals, and assorted scum, as well as mutants and heretical cults, because you can't have an overpopulated society without a few heretics. It has been said that the sacrifice of over a million imperial soldiers is worth one day of a hive world's production in weapons and armor. Perhaps even more valuable is what at first glance seems to be a byproduct of the design of a monolithic hive city. The population of any given world approximately doubles every century or so. With each hive housing between 10 to 100 billion people and 5 to 20 hives per planet, the sheer number of imperial citizens on a hive world is staggering. And each of those citizens is a potential soldier for the emperor's armies. Hives manufacture far more than steel and silica. They are vast factories for the most useful possible resource, human beings. Almost every recruit into the imperial guard from a hive world will already know how to handle a weapon. Hive worlds also serve to populate newly discovered planets. Imperial citizens are gathered from various hive worlds, willingly or unwillingly, by the administratum and shipped off to distant colonies discovered by the Adeptus Mechanicus explorator fleets. In common with the other imperial worlds, hive worlds are often based on a very obvious class system, with a ruling noble class and a bureaucratic middle class although with populations so tightly packed, there always develops a lower working class that often fuels violent street gangs. As can be expected, the upper classes are situated in the affluent upper areas of the hive, while the middle classes are situated in the middle areas, and the working classes are packed together in the lower areas. The very bottom sections of a hive city, the underhive as it's called, are often areas where the underclasses and criminals are said to be forgotten about and anarchy rules. Some extensively developed hive worlds do not even consist of various enclosed arcologies surrounded by a wasteland or a desert or plains. These hive worlds are completely urbanized and stacked with hundreds of layers of arcologies covering the entirety of the planet. The best example of such a super hive world is Terra itself. Hive cities are ancient constructions, each century slowly growing wider across the barren ground and higher into the polluted air. They dominate worlds where the local environment has all but collapsed, 
from long years of mining, harvesting, and waste dumping. These are nearly sealed ecosystems, where billions of people lived stack on top of each other, in the close confines of what is in essence a great metal tomb. A hive worlder lives out his life never seeing the sky, never knowing what the surface of the world looks like, and often never even leaves the city level on which he was born. Most hive worlds have scores of these constructs, each existing in isolation from one another. Hive worlders are often born into a house or family with their vocation decided. Thus they work endlessly at their task in the factorums and industrial hubs of the hive, producing goods to be shipped off-world, or maintaining the many systems of the hive so that its population might continue to survive and another generation to be born to replace them. Nearly everything within a hive is recycled and reused, and few things are ever wasted. The air a hive worlder breathes, the water he drinks, and the food he eats likely all has once passed through the bodies of countless others, endlessly restored to be consumed once again. When a hive worlder dies, his duty to the hive and house are not done, and most hives reconstitute their dead for the resources they can provide. All of a hive worlder's possessions, from the hab room in which he lives, to the clothes on his back, likewise come from those before him. Even in a system where the bulk of the hive residents must subsist on what meager resources can be divided among a billion hungry mouths and shivering bodies, there remains a definite division of class. From the spires of the hive top, where the highborn enjoy all the wealth of the Imperium, down through the heads of the guilds and houses that can still hope to live in relative comfort, to the workers and dregs, where resources become less abundant. The lower in a hive you go, the more decayed and dangerous it becomes, the detritus of billions drifting down to rest among the filth far below. The rule of law breaks down in the depths, where there is no system to govern what pitiful resources remain, if any. These are wild and deadly domains, where some hivers come to escape the rigid structure of the hive, but usually find only death and despair among the mutants and worse. That any civilization is free missed meals from anarchy is a saying even older than the Imperium itself. In any given hive, millions must live together in jostling proximity utterly dependent on a complex and gargantuan infrastructure for the mere basics of daily life, such as food, light, or even air. If widespread rioting, unrest, or serious disorder is allowed to ferment, it is possible that the threads binding the hive together may be broken, and millions may suffer as a result. It is said by some that this is one reason why the phenomena of the underhive is allowed to exist, in some form or another, on many hive worlds, as it is a sinkhole for the city's malice and sin. Despite unceasing vigilance and totalitarian control, catastrophic unrest does sometimes occur in even the most tightly ordered of hives and the history of the Calixis sector is filled with such calamities. Fang's world's infamous Tybird food riots saw Volk's population almost double inside a year, before natural attrition reduced it again in the following months. While the two decade-long periods of petty revolts and near-civil war caused by the misrule of House Koba on Malfi left a billion dead, and saw the final ruination of what had once been the most powerful noble family in the sector. In more recent times, even the mighty and prosperous Hive Sibelus has not proved to be immune. When heavy-handed magistratum tactics stirred up a hornet's nest of trouble during what came to be known as the Reinhold blackouts, open warfare broke out between the magistratum and criminal gangs, spilling over from the slums and into the hive's infrastructure. Power was cut to several dozen middle hive districts for five days, while anarchy took hold and tens of thousands died. The Shrine Worlds A shrine world of the Imperium is dominated by the religion of the Imperial cult and acts of devotion to the god-emperor. 
It may be that these places saw the birth of a famous imperial saint, or formed the battleground for a particularly important war in the Imperium's history. They are often studded with cathedrals, temples and shrines spread across the globe to the emperor and his saints. These worlds are frequently controlled directly by the ecclesiarchy, and may form training grounds for members of the Adeptus Ministorum and the Adeptus Sororitas. A shrine world can also be considered to belong to another category of world at the same time. As for example, Hagia is also classified as an agri world, while Herador is also a hive world. All shrine worlds will have a strong relationship with the imperial saint connected to the planet in question, such as being the world of his or her birth or death or the site of a major miracle the saint had performed in the name of the emperor. Religious grace permeates every part of a shrine world. The very spirit of the cult of the imperial creed, embodied by the world itself and its citizens, which embrace his divine worship. Shrine worlders live their lives with the strength of the emperor in their hearts, and exposed to his word in many aspects of their daily lives. It is one thing to acknowledge the might of the emperor, as all imperial citizens do, but quite another to see his deeds and the deeds of his saints on a daily basis, knowing that the world exists because of the power of the imperial creed. The exposure to clerics, priests and pilgrims also impacts upon their life. The higher proportion of these souls than on any other world, giving them greater veneration for the imperial creed which links all men together. Pilgrims especially offer a rare glimpse into worlds and sectors beyond the shrine worlder's home planet, and the taste of the Imperium beyond told from the lips of those who traveled far just to visit the shrines. Each reflects the diversity of the Imperial Creed, with every world worshipping the Emperor in its own manner, and so pilgrims might incorporate all manners of unique rituals and clothing as part of their native practices. Some might wear elaborate masks, allowing none but the Emperor to gaze at their faces. Others might wear boots and gloves filled with burrs and thorns, the better to know the Emperor's lament for his people. Conflicts are not uncommon between groups who have perhaps, for the first time, witnessed other ways of worshipping the Emperor. Sects that insist on drab colors might clash with those who favor colorful clothes, for example. Shrine worlds can vary greatly in the size and shape they take. Just as the saints and holy men of the Imperium take many forms, so too do the places they touch, and the worlds upon which they rest. There is no established norm for a shrine world, only that it is the place where a saint was entombed or committed some great deed, worthy of the attention of the Ministorum. A shrine world might have been a feral or hive world with a well-established society before the coming of the saint, changing the focus of its citizens and bringing attention from off-world. Equally, many shrine worlds were only outposts or dead worlds before a saint fought a final battle or came to find his final rest. In both cases, the presence of the saint and the millions of pilgrims who make the trek have changed the world forever, giving it a new purpose and a new place within the Imperium. There is another side to shrine worlds, however, a side that hides beneath the veneer of religion and conceals another face of the Imperium. While the world exists for the glory of the saint and as a place to worship the might of the emperor, the constant flow of pilgrims and visitors makes such a place a breeding ground for criminals and smugglers. Either selling false relics to the faithful or using the pilgrim trail to transport illegal goods, the underbelly of a shrine world is as active and dangerous as any underhive. Many, born on a planet dedicated to a saint, are drawn into this shadow world either aiding such illegal endeavors to make some coin or seeing it as a chance to escape and get off-world and make their own fortune. Even so, while some succeed and go on to find a life on the fringes of the Imperium among unsavory company, they remain shrine-worlders at heart, never forgetting the teachings of their saint, whether they live by them or not. 
And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about hive worlds and shrine worlds for today. I would ask if you'd like to live on a hive world, but no one in their sane mind would. Unless they live at the top, I guess. Shrine worlds, though, don't seem too bad, if you don't mind saying the Emperor protects about a thousand times a day. What are your opinions? Let me know in the comments below, along with any questions or thoughts you may have. As usual, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to click the like button, and maybe subscribe for future videos. And if you're a generous servant of the Emperor, check my Patreon page. The link is in the video description, where even a couple of dollars can make a big difference to me. I thank you very much for watching, and wish you a peaceful day. The Emperor Protects.